Okay, so, so now it is a, a great honor for me to introduce our next uh, keynote speaker. We're actually calling it the Innovation Keynote for this talk. So I'd like to introduce Pete Ron. Pete is the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. For those of you who've been following the uh, Hyperloop uh, interest on the East Coast, Pete is one of the people who is trying to figure out how to make it happen in the best interest of the public. So thank you, Pete. All right. Good afternoon. Hey, what a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation and the fact that uh, it was uh, actually uh, in conjunction with the competition out at uh, SpaceX for uh, the Boring Company. I did notice a few black bands around some wrists here that uh, obviously are folks that we're out at the competition yesterday. Uh, Saturday, we had the opportunity for a uh, tour by Steve Davis, who's the director of The Boring Company. And uh, Steve took uh, four of us into the tunnel, showed us that technology uh, and the, the way that they are undertaking their tunneling. So this, uh, th these three days have been amazing. And I very much have appreciated the uh, presentations this morning. Um, uh, and so, Nate, Nathan, are you still here, Nathan? Okay, I was just going to comment on there. I really think $20 for 350 miles is way, way, way too low. Uh, I think the free market is going to price it at whatever people are willing to pay, and therefore I think we'll see it more at some percentage of what comparable travel would be, meaning 60% um, of an airline ticket or something like that. So, but I don't want to get bogged down in those kinds of details yet. So, uh, let me tell you my history regarding the concept of Hyperloop. Uh, I was in Dallas, Texas at a meeting uh, with 10 other CEOs uh, of, uh, of the Departments of Transportation from around the country. And I saw the release from Elon Musk about the concept for a Hyperloop. And it hit the spot in my mind as to what was going to be this next leap in transportation as far as a mode. I had been looking at what was the um, what were the modes available to us, how long had they been around. Uh, when you look at how long it had been taking for one mode to replace another, it just seemed that we were due. That the jet engine had been around for about 70 years. Uh, certainly, it's a well-known, safe mode of transportation, but it's, it, again, has reached pretty much the maximum at which uh, the public is going to travel until maybe hyperplanes or something can do something different um, to travel long distances across the country or, or the globe. So when I saw the Hyperloop, it really did hit me to say, this is going to be that mode. And I told my fellow CEOs, I said, listen, you need to be ready because tomorrow you're going to get inundated with questions about the Hyperloop. And you need to know what they're talking about. So I passed that along. They said, OK, next day, absolutely nothing. The next day, nothing. The media, while a sector of it was, in fact, uh, covering the Hyperloop as this idea, the fact was the mainstream media, the transportation media, really was not paying much attention, in fact, any attention to this. And I was very much disappointed. I was expecting much more as far as the development of it. Um, my background is I was, a, I was Secretary of Transportation in New Mexico for eight years, and I was the Director of Transportation in Missouri for six years. Now, for the last three and a half years, I've been the Secretary of Transportation in Maryland. And I just had a sense that this was going to have more. We were approached about two, two and a half years ago by Hyperloop One. And Hyperloop One, uh, which I do believe is based here in Los Angeles, and they have a, their test facility in Las Vegas, uh, was approaching us about using Hyperloop to move freight out of the Port of Baltimore somewhere else. And they wanted to be paid to do that. They wanted us to pay them to construct this, this project. Um, I said, thanks for the idea, but 
I'm not, that's not the use I had envisioned that would, would be occurring, although it certainly made sense to, to move freight rather than people because it's going to take longer to get all the, the approvals to put humans inside of, uh, of a Hyperloop. H however, that I was encouraged that someone was out there actually talking about it. So uh, my chief of staff and I traveled out to Las Vegas, uh, I think it was May uh, of that year to uh, look at the test of their pod, of their skate, whatever you want to call it. And um, it was a lot of travel for a two and a half second blast down a, a very short track. Uh, but it, again, it, I was encouraged that, that people were actually investing money into this. Well, then I get a call from the governor's office and they said, we want you to uh, attend a meeting in uh, the White House uh, regarding technology. That's all I get. And of course, if, if anybody's been invited to a meeting in the White House, it generally means you're meeting over at the executive office, the Eisenhower executive office building next door. Um, and so that was my expectation. So I was really surprised when we actually went into the White House to have our meeting. And it was with um, uh, Reed Cordish, who was the, the president's advisor for technology, and then also DJ Gribben, who was the president's advisor for uh, infrastructure. And we sit down, and here's Steve Davis and another gentleman, I just I don't remember his name, along with the governor and myself and uh, the, the two advisors to the president. And Steve Davis passes a a contract over to me and says, we will build a Hyperloop from Washington to Baltimore on a fixed price basis. You can sign right here. And I'm like, well, you know, that's not how government works. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what I need to do to keep that from popping like that. I said, that's not how government works. But, you know, he's from SpaceX. I guess Steve Davis was the number nine employee at SpaceX. Uh, and he's got that high-tech mindset is you do it today. Uh, and I do know over this period of time he's gotten quite frustrated having to deal with government and the processes that we are forced to use. Uh, but I, I, have to, I was incredibly excited about this idea. And I immediately told the governor, we're sitting there, I said, I'll take the lead on this. And the governor goes, okay. I mean, it didn't seem to be a big deal to the governor. Um, and we had already uh, had gone to Japan about a year prior to this meeting in which we rode on the superconducting uh, maglev. And I, I suspect a number of you have done that, in which uh, 314 miles, and it's like you're on glass. You could stand up and pour yourself a cup of coffee and not worry about a drop being spilled. So the, the experience of that was, I mean, it was exhilarating. And my first response was, ooh, I want one of these. Um, and so uh, we had then be, been approached by the, the Northeast Maglev company. And so I've got these parallel talks here. So after this, the Maglev trip, uh, we're approached by the Northeast Maglev company who wants to build a, a superconducting Maglev from Washington, D.C., to New York. That's that Northeast Corridor. That's, that's the gold mine, probably along with uh, San Francisco to LA. I think those are the, the very lucrative routes that are out there for some high-speed travel. And so uh, they approached us, and our response has been the same to both Maglev and to Hyperloop, and that is we want to work with you, we want to assist you, but we will not invest taxpayer money in your endeavor. It's not the role, I believe, of taking taxpayer funds and, and frankly, betting on some roll of the dice that someone has a technology, no matter how promising going in. Uh, I don't believe that's the role. But the role of government can be more than to just sit by and watch. And that's what we are doing. Because as a Department of Transportation, we have a very valuable asset. And that's land. That's contiguous land. Land that can get you from one place to another. 
and we control it. So, um, so as these two projects have moved along, uh, MagLev, uh, which has uh, approached the, the State um, Public Service Commission and received a franchise as a railroad between Baltimore and Washington. They are now called the Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail is a new title for them and they are in the midst of an environmental impact statement. About 60% of what they want to provide is underground uh, and then the other is elevated. Hyperloop as they've approached and they are now in the midst of an environmental assessment. Now an EA, maybe you know, maybe not, an EIS is a laborious project. It takes lots of time. An EA, an environmental assessment, is a step below that and can generally be conducted uh, when the end result is predicted to be a, a, a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact. So what we are doing currently is we have an environmental impact statement going and we have a, an EA going. And the question is, well, who's going to use our land first? And I believe in a free market approach, which says whoever gets there first gets to use it, and whoever comes second is going to have to deal with whatever is in its way. I think Hyperloop is going to actually have the ability to be built before superconducting maglev. And I think one of those issues is frankly going to be the cost. Uh, superconducting maglev is very expensive. Um, I've heard figures uh, that in second hand, so I'm saying second hand, that uh, the company, uh, Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail, in approaching USDOT asked for $100 billion to construct maglev from Washington to New York. Now, even the federal government, $100 billion is a lot of money, right? Um, so we will see where they go, but we are supporting maglev in that we filed for federal planning funds and received uh, roughly $28 million for them to plan the, the project. And the company is having to provide the 20% match. So we're saying we're helping, we're doing those things that need to be done. However, private sector is having to fund, and they have been providing that 20%. Also on the Hyperloop side, it has been no cost. It is a totally privately funded project between Baltimore and Washington. And the Boring Company is who I've been dealing with. And again, I'll deal with anyone. I'll deal with, I mean, whomever wants to put transportation in our state, I'm willing to work with. So the Boring Company, uh, has already purchased property in Washington, D.C. as a starting point, and it's along New York Avenue. And they have uh, been negotiating for property in, in Washington, D.C., and I can't say where that is yet because they've not accomplished it, but I, I, I expect where it's going to go. Their issue is they're, they're going to utilize the Baltimore-Washington Parkway as their contiguous route. And again, it makes sense. Can you imagine trying to cut cross, cross country at any route and the number of property owners you're going to have to deal with. You're talking hundreds easily for a distance of 30 some miles. So the idea of using existing right of way and having negotiated use of it from, from uh, a DOT is actually, I think, a very smart idea and we want to support new kinds of transportation. And let me tell you why. I always say, you know, I have a secret about Maryland, and you can't tell anyone, right? We have a congestion problem, but don't tell anybody. See, the fact is we have horrible congestion, and I have to tell you, so we are generally, Washington, D.C. and L.A. are in a race to see who's ranked worst in the country every year, and we switch back and forth. But I've been here since Friday, so drove on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which weekends I understand today. I gotta tell you, it's not, the, the traffic in DC is much worse <laughs> than what I've experienced in LA. So it's horrible, it's a parking lot. So this, the, the, uh, the fact is, 
we have to undertake a solution or an approach to congestion that says all of the above. And typically all of the above would mean cars, buses, light rail, maybe heavy rail. That's it. Transit and cars. That's been considered all of the above. But we know that's, that's not working. That is not enough of all of the above. So uh, last week, uh, actually two weeks ago, I was in attendance at the, the Northeast Association of Transportation Officials, the DOTs, uh, which are 12 departments of transportation in the Northeast and two provinces in Canada. And we got together and we were focused on what is the technology of transportation beyond what we're using. And it actually turns out there's quite a bit. So the first conversation, we had a panel, and one was superconducting maglev. Uh, and then there was J-pods. If you're familiar with J-pods, you probably aren't. But it's an overhead pod system that's on cables. And it can operate independently of pods upon where people want to go. It can use existing right-of-way, and it, it's using another plane of, uh, of our transportation system because everything else we've been talking about has in essence been the ground. So J pods and then Uber was there and Uber had talked about Elevate and that is their uh, supposedly an autonomous uh, aircraft vehicle that's going to be able to take people around urban areas uh, and avoid surface transportation altogether. Now we also had attempted to get Terra Fugia uh, to come and present. Terra Fugia is based in Massachusetts, and I have to say played us along for a long time before they said they weren't going to attend. But as a company, they've been working for 12 years to come up with a flying car. And flying cars have the same response as most people have to the concept of Hyperloop. That's science fiction. But the reality is um, they are, they're real, and they were recently bought by Geely, uh, the Chinese uh, car manufacturing company. And so obviously someone saw something that they were willing to invest in. So they have a flying car, a true flying car. Um, so that's another technology. Uh, how we deal with that, who knows. Uh, the issue of drones. I, my take is that Elevate is in essence a very large drone that's going to transport people. I'm interested to see who's going to get in it, but, but. Um, and then we had uh, the Boring Company presented. And we had the CEOs, meaning the secretaries, commissioners, uh, directors, whatever their titles are, uh, and their staffs were in this meeting, about 300 people. And as Steve Davis was presenting, everyone was leaning forward in their seat. Not a single person got out. At the end of it, Delaware popped up and said, use us. So I believe that there is, from within government, a real desire to find this all of the above. I believe Hyperloop is one of those all of the aboves. And the more I've been exposed to it, the more confident I am that that's going to happen. So let me go back to the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. Um, I don't know if any of you have driven on it. Um, but the parkway is a really good name for it because you park a lot more than you drive. Uh, so it is a 30 mile, 34 mile long route. Uh, 18 miles of it are owned by the US Park Service. And they believe it to be as sacrosanct to them as Yellowstone and Yosemite. And then we've got a little over 10 and a half miles for the state of Maryland. The city of Baltimore has two and a half, and the District of Columbia has roughly something under one mile. I hope that all adds up to about 34 miles then. Uh, and so we, as a state, uh, after meeting with uh, the team of the Boring Company, after getting diagrams from them and uh, proprietary information, uh, we gave them a conditional utility permit. 
And what that allowed them to do is to proceed with further development of, of their concept with an expectation that once we have acceptable information from them and are satisfied that it will not do damage to our infrastructure, uh, we will give them an access permit and they will construct beneath our highway. Now there's nothing particularly unique about that. We have eight miles of the Washington DC metro system located under our highways already. So we are not proposing to do anything different than that has been done elsewhere. And uh, we are very supportive uh, of their concept. I believe it's real. Um, I, 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 I think there's a comment in my little uh, brief statement in the program that it said, I was fascinated when a poll had found that people believed we would make it to Mars before they believed we'd have Hyperloop. I, I, that, that surprises me. I do believe it's, it's real. I do believe it can be resolved. And I do believe it's going to be privately funded. Now the key to the boring company, where am I at? Am I almost done? Okay. So the approach of the boring company versus others, which I have seen that they're asking to be paid to put in place hyperloops. The boring company's approach is they don't want to be paid. Um, they want access and they will put it in. And their approach is very much like what they had already done with SpaceX. And that is to take a process that was outrageously expensive, meaning to, rock, uh, you know, to, to launch a rocket into space, outrageously expensive, and to come up with an approach that drastically reduced that price. That is what they are doing with their boring company. Some of you, I suspect, have heard their goal is to beat the garden snail. Current boring technology is 1 14th the speed that a common garden snail can travel. So they have a pet snail to remind them that that's what they're trying to do. Now I did ask Steve Davis, do they have the same snail that they started with? And he said, we seem to be better at boring holes than we are at uh, growing snails. So I'm assuming it means it died. But what, uh, what they are doing, though, is that they are just using, in essence, common sense to address the typical cost drivers of boring. And what I have seen, and if their numbers are real, it's what they're accomplishing. And so it's my, after what I have seen, they have the, a model that I think they're going to put in place. I do believe that Baltimore to Washington will be the first intercity use of Hyperloop uh, with, I think, eventually, it, at some point, we'll get to New York City. Um, I'm not sure there's going to be collaboration between the various companies as there was not collaboration when railroads had started. You know, the first railroad went from Baltimore to Ohio. The B&O Railroad was the first, the first. It had no idea of a national interconnected system. They went where the money was, and I think that's what we're going to see with Hyperloop. I think it's going to be put in place. I think it's going to be where they can make money. I've used up my time, and I'd be happy to answer questions if I can. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Uh, the property. Oh. Sure. The question was, what are the rights of property owners below their property? And within the United States, uh, property owners own to the center of the earth. Are you saying that's not correct? There, there are instances where you have mim where you, yeah. And you do, and I, now unless you, unless you don't have mineral rights, if you don't have mineral rights, then someone else can come and, and you know, go underneath your property, but with that exception. I don't think it's very likely. 
uh, the question was, what's the likelihood of global eminent domain underneath people's property? Property rights are just too strong in the United States. Even though someone would, would, has no intention of ever using their property 70 foot down, believe me, someone, you'll hear screams when someone proposes to do it without compensating them and getting their approval. Yes, sir. I'll start here and I'll come back. I do. So the question was the boring company has different systems. One is basically auto the skate, the automobile base, the other is the, the Hyperloop, which, which will be implemented how. Um, it's my understanding that the, the original concept from uh, Elon Musk was he wanted to be able to have his car go from, from the office to LAX without traffic. So that sort of put out this vision. In fact, they did a, a, a video of that. What we're talking about and what they're talking about in Maryland is that they're first calling the first step of it is the loop. They've taken the word hyper off of it, and what they're doing is proposing to use the, the chassis of, of uh, the Model S's with large batteries and putting pods on top of those and operating those at speeds of roughly 150 miles an hour. And then eventually, when they have the ability and an approved pod that can withstand pressures or lack of pressure, uh, they would upgrade it to a hyperloop. So I think what we're going to see first is, and I have to tell you, you can get me between Washington, D.C. And, and Baltimore at 150 miles an hour. I'd be very happy. But the idea of going faster than that. There was a question somewhere. Yes, sir. How much cheaper are they? I, I, so the question was, how much cheaper is the boring company than conventional? Um, I'm afraid that's, that's been provided to me on a proprietary basis. All I can say is they are, they are significantly less costly at the moment, and they are looking to drive that cost down even more. I have no reason to believe they're not credible. I believe someone until they prove to me that I can't believe them. So far, they have produced everything they said they were going to do. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was, once the, the Hyperloop uh, tube is in place, who is it owned by? And it would be owned by the boring company. The same as when we have cities putting their pipes beneath our roadways, they get access permits on the condition that if we ever need them to move it, it's moved at their expense. So the, the concept is we will negotiate uh, some remuneration for access to our right of way. And I frankly would like to see something that would be on an ongoing basis. But we've not, we've not gone there yet. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know what their plans are for the use of their tubes. Um, I, in the conversation on Saturday as we were going into their tube, um, they had pointed out that a number of, of cables that were currently in the tube would be removed eventually. It's one of the things they've done is they actually have LED lights in there. And it was a toy they kept sitting there changing the lights inside of the tube. and. Is sort of a disco effect. You've been a asking for a while. Uh, what do you think of the possibility of maybe using land under the existing uh, highway interstate and system? Like if you have the most of the extra JTA system along with the state of 
The question at its heart is, do I see Hyperloop being able to go underneath interstate highways, in essence? Um, and uh, it's a, a general misconception that the federal government owns the interstates, right? The case of the Baltimore-Washington Parkway with this 18 miles is actually uh, an anomaly for ownership in which the federal government owns this. Interstates are owned by the states. So I would, I would in fact, expect to see I-95 being used as a route to get to, to New York. I expect it. I've not been told that. I'm just, you know, so the, the state that's willing to let them use right away, I would say, would not see any other issue with the use of interstates as well as other highways. Uh, if they're allowing to do it. And I think what's interesting is, uh, we would, so I would think that the boring company would run into more issues with pilings for bridges and such along the interstates, and their response is they'll just go deeper. Yes, sir. Cryogenic uh, fuel plane that would take off like a regular aircraft going to space and land. Yeah. It got canceled, of course, when big science got canceled in the early 90s. But I recently read that Boeing, I think Boeing is going to build the same thing, but it's going to be a transport. Are you aware of this? I am. Uh, so that's the hyper aircraft that uh, I, I think the military is, has already developed, frankly. And they're talking about the use of that in um, uh, in civil aviation at some point. Uh, the, the only issue I see there is when you're talking about that kind of propulsion and size, you're talking, I think, very expensive and very limited in the number of people that could actually be transported that way. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh huh. That's yeah. I was interested in your presentation on Holloman Air Force Base because I grew up in uh, Alamogordo, New Mexico, which is right there, and I got to meet the gentleman a couple of times who rode that sled to be the first human to exceed the the speed of sound. So that was all there. Yes, sir. Oh, wait a minute. This young man. Okay, this young man. The question is sort of how will the environment of transportation evolve and will all of our current modes survive? And how will Hyperloop evolve? I think is does that capture your question? Okay. So I I think uh, jet aircraft will continue. I think airlines um, will continue to serve at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, a ready market. Uh, if I was Amtrak, I would be worried. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Uh, <laughs> are you with Amtrak? That's right. You told me that before, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do. I, I think Amtrak should be concerned. Um, I think cars are going to continue to be there in some form, whether 
you know, are they autonomous? Are they electric or whatever? I'm, I'm hoping that autonomous cars are going to make it before they take my keys away from me. So, you know, I, I, I think we will see a lot. I, I frankly think, though, that passenger rail is going to be the most threatened by a developed hyperloop. Oh, J pods and yeah, I, yes, and and you know, again, I believe in the, the the marketplace selecting right the survival of modes of transportation. So I J pods, if they offer something unique and they can carve out a niche, I think we'll see J pods. Um, I, again, it's going to be what's the niche that a particular mode is going to take. I think right now is an amazing time to be involved in transportation. That it's exciting to see what's going on. There was one more, I was allowed one more question and there was something, yes sir. Thank you very much. Uh, when you consider the uh, need to make money, who uh, would Well, I suspect that that a company implementing Hyperloop will go where wherever they can go and who will allow them. And if railroads would allow them that then I would suspect they're not going to get under the Amtrak rail uh, between Washington and, and New York. Um, but the idea of, see, I, maglev is a, is a technology that really means you cannot have very many stops, right? So the, the concept between Washington and Baltimore is that it will stop only at the BWI airport and that's it. Hyperloop because these are smaller pods, will have, I think, a lot more flexibility with a lot more branches coming off up and down the corridor. Uh, so I, I think from a convenience standpoint and a relying upon it as a means of commuting will be quite enticing. And that's my limit on questions, I'm told. Okay, Steve, thank you so much. Thank you. I so hate to cut off questions because uh, you know people here are excited about the, the technology, but when they hear you talk, it makes it so much more real and so much more near future to, to hear what's going on there. So thank you again.